Wow. You know, it's really tough to follow a couple of guys like this on a panel discussion. Uh, I hope that I can, I can come close to what they did. But it's pretty easy to see why they are effective leaders uh, in transforming their organizations for the utility of the future. Um, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you a story today that's a little bit different. I'm not going to use the smart word, I don't think at all, um, in my presentation. You know, as in a, our utilities, we deal with crises, disasters, uh, issues every day. Every day we have wind or uh, lightning, something that's going to knock a tree limb down on a tr uh, an electric wire, knock out someone's service. We have equipment, old transformers or other equipment that fails, causing power outages. Uh, we have drunk drivers that decide to bond with our utility assets, poles and other assets. Uh, we have squirrels or other uh, curious critters who decide to go places that we had never intended for them to go. Uh, but that's all in a day's work. That's what we do. But occasionally things happen, a, a crisis or disaster comes along that really is a life changer, a game changer for our organization. And that's what I'm going to talk about today is an event that happened in Nashville one year ago that uh, had a very significant change on the way we do business and the way we uh, interact with our customers. You know, when you have a disaster or a crisis, you learn a lot. You learn about systems and processes, uh, equipment that doesn't work exactly the way you thought or doesn't work in a particular situation. Uh, we don't get a lot of ice and snow in Nashville, but a few years ago we had a big ice storm, and uh, our men were out trying to work, and they realized that they couldn't get any traction. The boots that they normally wear just didn't, didn't work on ice. And uh, we discovered something that, that folks up in the north have used for years, the, uh, the little uh, clamp-on uh, grippers or, or traction devices. So, so you find out during these disasters, you learn a lot about things you had never thought about before. And you change your processes, you improve for the next time around. But another thing that happens sometimes in, the, in certain disasters, uh, there could be there are other repercussions. Uh, legal or regulatory changes come about as a result of that. And I want to talk about a couple of those. If you think back to the, the disaster at Three Mile Island in 1979 up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and then a few years later in the Soviet Union, uh, the disaster at another nuclear plant in Chernobyl, pretty much stopped the construction of nuclear power plants in the United States. Uh, another event that's not on my chart that, that's dear to my heart was the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995. And I bet if you think about security at your office building, at your premises, the way you screen visitors at the, at the uh, door, uh, your parking regulations, uh, where you let visitors park, probably a lot of those uh, processes and standards go back to the federal building situation. How many of you in recently have seen a car, an unattended car, parked at an airport terminal, in front of the airport terminal? Doesn't happen, does it? You know, within seconds, the tow truck's out there and tows it away. Of course, we all know from 9-11, from uh, most of you will be flying home today, and you'll see a lot of uh, effects of, of that disaster in terms of the way you interface with the airline. Uh, a lot of those unpleasant uh, processes, but we've learned that they're necessary to keep us safe. Some other disasters I've mentioned there that have affected us uh, and have been game changers. We'd like to talk briefly about some things that have, have, been, that have happened to us over the years that have changed the way we do business. Uh, and I have those highlighted in red. Uh, not everything that's changed in our, our business at National Electric Service has been a result of the disaster. I put some other things in blue that we did through our normal planning processes, advances in technology, etc. But shortly after I joined Nashville Electric Service in 1994, we had an ice storm that hit us. Uh, I say we had 150,000 customers out. We have no idea how many customers were out. Uh, we did not have an outage management system or processes or any way to really know. Uh, we kind of guessed based on the number of circuits that were locked out and kind of doing some rough analysis of maps. The other thing that's relevant to that number is that's about half of our customers. So half of them were out of power, many of them for up to two weeks. Lots of, of backlash from our uh, uh, Metropolitan Council and, and other, uh, other folks in the community uh, made us change the way we did business. We implemented an outage management system. Our, our 
maps went from being printed on pieces of paper and mounted on cardboard. Uh, they're now in a GIS system. We, uh, as you notice on my chart, we had an IVR system. We had bought it just before that, but found out that it really wasn't configured and prepared and, and uh, didn't have the capacity to deal with the disaster. So we made a lot of changes and continue to make a lot of changes in that technology. Uh, we've upgraded our phone system and, and uh, made some other uh, improvements there. Uh, later on, a few years, uh, in 1998, we had a tornado come through Nashville, actually passed right over our, our office building, uh, knocked out power to our building, our headquarters building, before it hit downtown, uh, knocked out a lot of windows downtown, and then finally sat down just across the highway and wiped out some, some neighborhoods uh, near the downtown area. We discovered then that, yeah, we have a backup generator, but we had added so much technology, especially, especially since 1994 when we were putting in outage management and new phone systems and IVRs and uh, our old emergency backup generators didn't deal with, with that very well. So learned another lesson. We needed to upgrade that so that we could respond to, to future uh, disasters. But a year ago, May 1st of last year, uh, we had another disaster in Nashville that I'm going to uh, focus my attention on, a flood. Uh, and most of you have some perspective for that. If you were registered for the conference last year, you remember it was supposed to be at Gaylord Opryland in Nashville. Uh, it's a hotel similar to this. The Opryland is the original, and it's the, uh, uh, the anchor hotel of the Gaylord chain, laid out somewhat like this, but it's two to three times as big. It has twice as many rooms and probably, I think, maybe three times as, as much atrium space based on my rough calculation, but a huge facility. Uh, as a result of the flooding that occurred, uh, Jerry Duvall, I think at one point Jerry t thought about canceling CS Week 2010, uh, but through his efforts and the efforts of his staff in cooperation with the, the uh, National Convention and Tourism uh, Board, they were able to relocate the, uh, the conference downtown to our convention center there. You moved your hotels, uh, stayed in the hotels in the downtown area. And I do want to take just a minute to thank Jerry and, and all of the staff at CS Week uh, for doing that and for all of you coming to Nashville because it was a great uplifting for us after suffering a, a disaster to have people come back into the community, go into our restaurants. And in fact, many of the restaurants and music venues that you visited when you were there last year have been closed for a couple of weeks prior to, to your visit because of, of water or because of a lack of electricity. Uh, but again, Jerry, we thank you and we, we thank all of you who came to Nashville last year. So how did all that happen? Well, it started on a Saturday morning, uh, May 1st, and over the course of the weekend, this is a rainfall map, and I think you can see the colors. I can't point any of them out. I don't have a, any uh, pointing technology up here, but the, the red sections were areas that received over 10 inches of rain. Nashville is right in the middle. That's uh, Tennessee across the middle, uh, Kentucky at the top, the northern sections of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi across the bottom. But Nashville's right in the middle. You see all the red areas with 10 inches of rain or more. The white areas just from downtown Nashville down to the southeast, received over 15 inches of rain in a 48-hour period. Well, really less than that from, from Saturday morning until Sunday evening, so uh, a 36-hour period, actually. Uh, that's a lot of rain to deal with, lots of rain to deal with. What happened? Well, here's one picture, and this is actually from Saturday afternoon. Uh, the cars, the, the truck you see there are actually on Interstate 24 in Nashville, uh, the building that you see in the background is not a building on the side of the road, not a gas station or anything. That's a portable building from a, a nearby school that broke loose and floated out onto the interstate. So it's floating down the, uh, the highway along with the vehicles. I have some other photographs. Uh, this is the Cumberland River. Cumberland River comes through Nashville, comes right through the downtown area. Uh, the section you see near the back where you see the straight line of trees is the original channel of the river. But this is how it began to spread out. Uh, and this, actually, this is very near the Opryland area. And I will have some pictures of the Opryland Hotel in a minute as well. This is one of our two water treatment stations, our water treatment plants in Nashville. Uh, as you can tell, it, it's not operating at this point. It was completely swamped. So we're down to 50% water capacity. And in fact, our other uh, water treatment uh, plant is about five miles downriver came close to flooding as well. Had it not been for volunteers who were assembled to go out and sandbag around it, we would have been out of water in Nashville. Uh, again, 50% capacity. We went on water rationing. 
and uh, hopefully I'll be able to add an anecdote later on about our Metro Water Director as we talk about some of the how he responded to that uh, uh, that issue but some significant uh, issues for our city uh, just some additional photographs from the downtown area uh, this is actually First Avenue. If any of you have been in the uh, Wild Horse Saloon uh, down on Second Avenue, the back of the Wild Horse is here on First Avenue. I uh, don't think there was a lot of dancing during this period. Uh, we lost, in addition to all this damage in the city as the electric utility, we had some significant damage as well. We have basically three facilities. We have our downtown office uh, headquarters. We have a, a, a T&D center on the east side of the city near the airport and one on the west side of the city. Uh, that the west side uh, west service center was completely lost as a result of rising floodwaters. We had crews working out of that center throughout the uh, uh, while it was raining, and they came back to the center. Many of them to find that uh, their personal vehicles had been flooded. Uh, a lot of tr uh, bucket trucks and, and uh, augers and other equipment that was parked there uh, actually had been flooded. Uh, the waters came so quickly, uh, we didn't even have time to evacuate the equipment. The uh, lots of material, the entire material uh, warehouse or uh, inventory there, poles, cross arms, overhead transformers, uh, wire, everything was, was washed away, was, was pretty much unusable. Uh, we lost lots of tools. Uh, you know, I talk about rubber goods is something we lost. And, and you know, you, what's the big deal? You know, you've got some someplace else, but actually we didn't. You know, the amount of rubber goods that we need to cover up uh, insul uh, conductors to do overhead work was missing was gone through the flood. Uh, fortunately, we had a sister utility who uh, was able to loan us enough rubber goods that we could continue to do our, our line work. Uh, and I want to show you some other pictures that will talk about the environmental issue from the fuel spill and the material that uh, floated onto uh, the neighboring roadway. This is our West Service Center. Uh, it's really kind of a depressing picture to, to, to see uh, just the top of the booms of the bucket trucks uh, when we went out there. Uh, some additional pictures there. You see we have a, a large substation uh, at this location that was uh, totally out of operation as a result of the flood. Uh, we went out, of course, to inspect the substation in boats. Very interesting approach. Uh, I think, uh, I'm thinking this is either the fire department or a TVA boat because initially uh, we don't have any boats. We don't have any boats in our fleet. <laughs> None. But we had one engineer, actually our environmental engineer, who had a kayak, and I, I didn't bring pictures of, of Rob in the kayak, but, but the first inspections Rob did in his kayak. Uh, but this is what he was looking at. We had over, uh, above ground fuel storage tanks for diesel and gasoline, et cetera, broke loose, began to, to, to leak fuel into the water, and for any of you who are involved in environmental issues at all, you know that's, that's a real difficult thing to deal with. So we had to, uh, to deal with an environmental spill. Uh, of course, you see the poles. They floated everywhere. They floated across the roadway. Uh, lots of cleanup for us to do.